like my my puppy over here he probably doesn't have a concept of like an ego or his own self he may or may not i, I don't like to speculate too much on them because <laughs> the more we learn about them right the more surprising they are it's that's true that's true and, and yeah i don't know dog yeah we just got a dog a couple of years ago like got on the covid bandwagon yeah yeah <laughs> that's great I'm always, I'm always impressed by this it sometimes acts like it has an abiding self yeah i mean it has memories it freaks me out because I don't know how to deal with that. Yeah, I, I love it when I'm playing with them. But then when I go and I sit in my armchair and I look at them, I'm like, what's going on in this guy's head right now? Hey, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. I'm your host, Parker Setacase, and this is a podcast where we explore all the deepest ideas and questions in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I really love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. On this episode, we're going to be talking about phenomenology, and uh, that can be kind of a, a big word. Uh, I understand that, but it's an awesome school of philosophy. Uh, I actually am not sure how to describe it, but I have with me Dr. Walter Hopp. He's a professor of philosophy at Boston University, and we're going to be talking about his book, Phenomenology, A Contemporary Introduction, and it's uh, in the Routledge series of contemporary introductions to philosophy, and I love that series. If you guys know me at all, I've had several of the several several of those philosophers on to cover their books because i love it so i do recommend if you want to get introduced to contemporary philosophy get caught up get up to date grab grab this book first um, and then grab the others too there's epistemology and philosophy of language and philosophy of logic it's it's a good series so uh before we jump in though i want to thank everyone who is making this podcast happen over on patreon if you have benefited personally from this podcast please consider becoming a patreon patron you can join for as little as $3 a month or as much as $100 a month. And uh, there's different levels of things you get. I always forget what to call them, but perks uh, for, for joining at different levels. If you join at $100 a month, uh, I think one of the perks is you. I consider you part of my family or close to being part of my family. So check that one out as well. Uh, another way you can support the podcast, if you're watching on YouTube, is uh, this new thing that YouTube is rolling out called Super Thanks. And so you can see that here in the bottom somewhere. It says Super Thanks. And if you don't want to commit to a monthly Patreon amount uh, and you like this episode or you like a particular argument in this episode, you can just click Super Thanks and you can give uh, whatever amount you want there. So that's huge. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please leave me a five-star review uh, and a comment. That would be huge. It really helps the algorithms uh, think that this is a good podcast. So without further ado, uh, no more commodifying myself. Let's talk with Dr. Walter Hopp about phenomenology, consciousness, and everything else uh, that that covers. I'm super excited for it. Dr. Hopp, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, so like I said before, the book is Phenomenology, A Contemporary Introduction. And I was telling you off air that I'm so sad that we can't cover all of it because it's so good, but it's so dense. And um, you even apologized in the beginning for, in the beginning of the book for the, uh, the jargon that is just so necessary. Like you, you have to use the jargon if you're going to be talking about phenomenology. But I thought you did an amazing job of um, introducing it, and then you know, sucking me at least, sucking me into the world of phenomenology to understand what guys like Husserl are talking about. So, so thanks for the book. It's awesome. Well, thanks, thanks for your kind words. Yeah, I wish I'd done better to tame that jargon, but I just didn't figure out a way to do it. So, well, it's tricky. It. Um, before we jump in on phenomenology, though, I, I, I'm always curious to know how my guests got into, you know, their their field. So how'd you become a philosopher? I don't know. It's always easy to, I guess, make up a story here. But <laughs> if you're asking me to make up a story, I, I guess, I guess the, the, the version that I like to think is true is that somehow I was prodded into philosophy initially by punk rock. Well, wow, okay. I listened to a bunch of especially local bands in the Boulder, Denver area, like Dead Silence, who were pretty politically active. Huh. And they taught a 13, 14 year old me that the world is big and full of problems. Wow. And uh, the, other, the other aspect of this is that I was grounded a lot. Mm. <laughs> and my parents had a decent library. Okay. So I started kind of plowing through some of the books and in the library at home and my sister who's four years older is off at college recommending that i read this or that novel wow so i just started sort of reading a bit and um finally i stumbled upon schopenhauer after reading dr faustus by thomas mann mm. so schopenhauer is the first philosopher i read and when i went to college i didn't declare philosophy my major until actually like my third year 
Hmm. But it, those were the classes that I just enjoyed the most. So okay, wow, that's how it happened. Well, okay, so that's that's really an interesting approach uh, or uh, interesting story into philosophy. But then you wrote this book on phenomenology, and yeah. is phenomenology like the punk rock of philosophy? Because like, um, <laughs> I it's wish not, it were that cool. <laughs> I don't well, think. it's it's not it's not the usual, you know. So you're in the you're in the Anglo-American uh, tradition, and you're, you're not explicitly. You didn't write an analytic philosophy book. You wrote a phenomenology book. So how did how did you end up getting interested in phenomenology against like the yeah. cultural trends and stuff too? Yeah, yeah. I the I didn't study phenomenology at all or read one word of it as hmm. an undergraduate. Okay. So when I went to graduate, I took three years off after graduating and started graduate school when I was twenty five. And my first year, I made friends with a guy named Dave Casimir, who's still mm -hmm. my best friend. Huh. And after getting into arguments and discussions with Dave, he just seemed really skilled because he was and is really skilled at drawing distinctions and describing things, tearing down the positions that I found rather dear. <laughs> and, and, and he recommended that I read Husserl's Logical Investigations. So in the summer between my first and second year of graduate school, I did that and took what I could from it. Mm -hmm. Alice Willard was who became my advisor. He was on sabbatical my first year of graduate school. But I heard that he was the Husserl guy. Yeah. So when he came back my second year at the beginning of the semester, I arranged to meet with him. And after a couple of meetings with him, it was clear to me that I was going to be working on Husserl. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. In my first year, I thought I really got into Thomas Reed, mm -hmm. another of Dallas's favorite modern philosophers, and his version of direct realism. And when I read Husserl's investigations, I found something very something that appealed to me in the same way that Reed did, but with way more distinctions and way more mm. descriptive accuracy. Okay. So it's, that's, that's sort of how it grew up. Just, okay. Husserl had a way of explaining and describing the life of consciousness and knowledge that was just way more appealing than anything I was finding either in historical thinkers or in contemporary analytic philosophy. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm, I'm slowly, uh, I feel like I'm being pushed into phenomenology because I study with, uh, Brandon Rickabaugh, and he'll just make some distinctions or, you know, something and be like, you know, Husserl said this a long time ago. I'm like, dang it. I guess I got to read some more Husserl. <laughs> so, um, but, but your, your book was a great, uh, um, if you're, if you're playing like Mario Kart and you go over like this arrow and it shoots you forward, I feel like your, your book is that arrow I'm driving and it's <laughs> shooting me for. So, cause I, I did pick up logical investigations and I, uh, quickly put it right back down. Cause I was like, I, I can't do it right now. I need, I need I like, know. I need a lot of time to sit and just, just chew on this. And, um, yep. I, some, some, some people, I think like CS Lewis says like, Hey, look, just go to the primary sources and don't worry about secondary stuff as much. I think people worry about that too much, but in this case, the secondary stuff has been a huge help, uh, in, in making me want to go back to, uh, to reading logical investigations. Um, but before we jump in too much, um, what, help us with phenomenology what what is it and then what does it mean to like practice philosophy from a, a phenomenological perspective i mean you know the slogan as you probably know for phenomenology especially among the early phenomenologists was to the things themselves right mm. so what does it mean to the things themselves well the idea that they had was that if we want to elucidate philosophically important concepts what we should do is turn to the things themselves that those concepts refer to mm. in the sorts of experiences in which those objects are given or present to us, right? So somehow it involves establishing a distinctive kind of cognitive relationship with an object where that object is present or given, describing its features. Its task is mainly descriptive. It's not, as Husserl points out, in the business of deductive theorizing. Mm. And to do so without falsification and without the tyranny of working under some theory or worldview that simply is going to rule out the phenomena as they're presented to us. Yeah. Because I think that all too often happens in, in, in to us philosophers. Um, so that's, that's basically what it is. And the early phenomenologists, you know, they analyzed all kinds of stuff. What they thought they were gaining through this process were eidetic insights, as they often put it, insights into the essence or nature of something. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's under Husserl, really, that phenomenology, I mean, all of them were concerned with consciousness in some way or other. Mm -hmm. It's with Husserl that we get the sort of turn to 
what later becomes known as transcendental phenomenology, of which the investigations was the breakthrough work. Of course, phenomenology also refers to a certain tradition that begins with Husserl and his co-workers. Um, that tradition, as far as I can tell, and I say this in the book, I mean, its main unity is sociological. It's yeah. unified by figures and influences and chains of historical causation and who's responding to who. Um, phenomenology, though, as I like to think about, it, is first of all a method of disclosing and elucidating philosophical concepts through a return to originary intuition. I'm getting into yeah. jargon already. Yeah, it's good. Though. Right. So phenomenology is already pretty front loaded with some what have become some pretty controversial theses about the nature of intentionality and consciousness. For yeah. instance, that there's such a thing as something being given <laughs> among others. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's perhaps not as presuppositionless as Husserl and other practitioners like to like to think. Wow, that's a good point. That's that's fascinating. That's really good. Um, that's spicy a little bit. So um, I wonder, some people will, will be familiar. You, um, you said the, the catchphrase to the things themselves. And we talk about, you know, phenomenology, phenomena. Some people who, who have studied Kant will, will be thinking in some Kantian categories. We talked about transcendental a little bit. So so in, in Kant, we have this transcendental idealism. And a lot of the people that I've studied from have said, you know, it looks like... Uh, interpreting Kant is hard and as it is with everyone. Right. But, yeah. um, it seems like he's, he's cut us off from the noumena from the things in themselves and, right. uh, phenomenology is saying like, no, we, we go back to the things in themselves. So how is, how is, um, transcendental phenomenology, uh, different than transcendental idealism? Well, it's a good question. And Husserl actually characterizes his own position as a version of transcendental idealism. Okay. Okay. So now the first thing I'd like to point out is that Husserl's slogan is not to the things in themselves, it's to the things themselves. Okay. Whether things themselves turn out to be things in themselves is one question, and mm -hmm. whether they turn out to be things in themselves in the way that Kant means that phrase is a yet further question. Okay. So turning to the things themselves, I mean, I can turn to what it is to be a promise, as Reinach did, without raising the question of whether promises are Kantian things in themselves or not. Okay. Promises have have certain properties, right? There, it requires a promisee and mm -hmm. somebody who receives the promise. And it, as a result of a promise being given, one party incurs an obligation and the other gains an entitlement to something. Uh, that's just going to be the nature of promises, whatever their ontological status turns out to be. So I take it that one thing that phenomenology does is it doesn't begin with any assumption about the question of whether the objects with which it's dealing are Kantian things in themselves or not. Okay. That would be something that emerges later. Mm. But I think there is a big difference. I mean, you said that Kant's hard to interpret, and there are a lot of different ways of understanding what his transcendental idealism amounts yeah. to, right? right some right. of them more metaphysical, like the interpretation you're given, some of them not so much so. In Husserl's case, I think transcendental idealism um, is not a version of idealism, oddly enough, as we normally think about it. It's not a thesis about to the effect that the objects of thought, perception, and knowledge are in any way ontologically dependent upon or shaped by our awareness of them. Yeah. It's really a thesis to the effect that there are ideal essential relationships governing which conscious acts in virtue of their nature or their intentional content can achieve a relationship with objects of a certain type. Okay. And that's compatible Right. It's compatible with the claim that, say, a spatial object can only appear partially in perception. That by itself doesn't entail anything about the ontological status of those objects. Okay. So the idealism there is really a claim about ideal and necessary connections. That was Dallas's line. And I've, I, I, I think that's correct. There are passages in Husserl which challenge that interpretation, but I yeah. find it the most philosophically um, gratifying and plausible version of the view. Yeah. Okay. That that's helpful. I'm a, you know, so I'm a, I'm a Christian and I think that, that God designed the world. I, I, when I think of like ideal relations and connections, it seems really at home in like a theistic picture of the world. Um, do you know, like, was Husserl a theist or like, where, where, yeah, where yeah, are he these? Was. okay. Did, yeah, he was. did he ground those in God or did he not say much about those ideal connections and relations? Didn't say much about them, but it seems like Husserl is not, I don't find much evidence, and I'm 
ready to be contradicted by sure. a scholar who can point out a place. I don't find much evidence that he grounds essential relationships in God's will or God's creative power. Okay. In fact, he often makes claims to the effect that with respect to certain claims of essence that even God could not alter them. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So okay. even God can't change the fact that a spatial object can only appear perspectively is one example he gives. So it looks like he has a view on which these essential laws um, don't have any essential reference to being created mm. to either the mind or the or the volition of God. Okay. Yeah. That's that's fascinating. That's really fascinating. Um, okay, that's great. So uh, I talked with Aaron Preston a little bit about like the the historical roots of phenomenology and analytic philosophy, and you you brought up this point uh, a couple times in the book, at least a couple, about uh, Husserl and how it doesn't seem like he's that far from like Frege, and uh, I don't know how to say it, Frege, 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 but, yeah. uh, Frege. Um, can you can you just lay that out for us a little bit more? Because because for some people, phenomenology, if you look at it today seems like it's in a crazy place to depending on what which phenomenolo phenomenologist you look at <laughs> yeah. and and they say well you know that's over on the continental side and i don't mess with that because i'm an analytic guy right. but it's it, like the roots husserl didn't seem too far from from frega and i think even like russell gave a positive writing uh 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 review or something of logical investigations do you know can you help us with with that at all the the roots of it well, you know, I mean, they, they were contending with similar issues, especially about the foundations of logic and mathematics. And arguably, all three of them were drawn to an anti-idealistic stance regarding the nature and status of the types of entities with which logic and mathematics deals. So in Husserl's philosophy of arithmetic, you know, the first book he, he published, nobody cited more than Frege. Wow. And of course, Frege famously reviews this book and accuses it of psychologism. By the time we get to Husserl's logical investigation, a large portion of the first couple hundred pages, the prolegomena is dedicated to a refutation of psychologism, the mm. view that logic is a branch of psychology and that yeah. logical claims are to be are made true by and established on the basis of consultation with human psychological episodes. Yeah, This push against psychologism, I think, is really what is most common between Husserl and Frege and their conception of mathematical and logical entities as occupying, in Frege's word, a third realm. Yeah. Right. So we get an ontology in Husserl's investigations where the most fundamental distinction is between real and ideal being. And then what marks real being is its temporality. So both mental states and material physical states are on the side of real being. And mm. then ideal being is a temporal entity is like the number two or the logical form modus ponens. And so those entities, um, they, they they exist. He says, he even uses the word existere, and they exist, but they're not real in the sense of existing in time, which is uh, very similar, I think, to, to Frege's views. Okay. I mean, Frege is, I know there's probably other interpretations, which would- Always. Be real, but, you know, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so in today's parlance, they're committed to a kind of Platonism, a belief in abstract yeah. entities. In Husserl's yeah. case, it looks like it's a belief in entities, abstract entities, which don't depend upon being made objects of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And in the case of properties, don't depend on actual instantiation. Okay. That's awesome. I love that. I, 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 I lean that way myself. And then I want to go full circle and, and ground it in God, but that's notoriously tricky. Um, <laughs> all of it. It's all so tricky. It's all so hard. And yeah, that's you... tricky. I don't know how to go yeah. about doing that. I mean, <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, well, so uh, the phen the phenomena of phenomenology uh, is everything that I care so deeply about. And so that's why it's becoming more and more apparent to me that I just have to study this stuff, the, the phenomenologist more, especially Husserl, because um, like the phenomena that, that is seeking to be uh, explained is like consciousness, intentionality, meaning, perception and knowledge. And I just... That's, that's part I mean. of it. I mean, that's the sort of the that's the that's the ground level. I mean, there's yeah. other things like the phenomenology of value. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. Other people and I don't care about value. I just stick that over. <laughs> no, I do. Um, I think in the book you said that knowledge is like, like the the crown jewel. You didn't say that in that way, but but like the the bedrock or something. Is that right? Am I getting that right? That the knowledge yeah. is like okay, yeah. okay, that's fantastic. Um. It's yeah, that's an interpretation I'm sort of pushing, and okay. I, it, it really seems to me that Husserl cares more about knowledge than anything else. And ultimately, it seems to me that on his view, 
And Philip Berghofer has written a series of papers recently defending this view. Okay. The Husserl is a foundationalist who grounds all knowledge in the givenness of things. But really, it, it, it goes even deeper than that. He grounds, I think, all intentionality in the givenness of things. Mm. Um, even being able to, uh, as I say, um, following Dallas, really authentically thinking about things depends upon givenness as well. And givenness is a type of knowledge. So I think for Husserl, it's a good case of, um, yeah, the primacy of knowledge. Yeah. Not just for, not only that all knowledge is grounded in evidence, but even the capacity to think is grounded in us knowing things. Okay. So, so that, that givenness, um, I'm, uh, is that like, like you said there, the, the connection between the phenomenologists is, uh, it's not like they're all working on the same project. Right. Uh, they, they just have different, like similar methods. Um, and, and like, even that might be a stretch because I don't think the later phenomenologists are necessarily yeah. using Husserl's methods. Right. right. So, so Heidegger has like some, some givenness going on. Um, is Husserl's, when he says givenness, is, what does that mean? Is it, is it, is it different than what Heidegger, Heidegger says in givenness and in, in being revealed to things, things being revealed to you and such? Well, it is things being revealed to you, but I okay. think that yeah, I'm I'm not that I'm not familiar enough with Heidegger's theory. Oh, good, because I don't want to talk to, about Heidegger. <laughs> yeah, to to say too much about the comparisons and contrasts. Cool. For this one, I think it, the best way to elucidate is just to start providing examples. Okay. And one of the theses that Husserl has about the nature of consciousness is that any object that we can we we can merely think about things. Right. Right now, yeah. I can think about Mars, and I can think about the weather in Vancouver. And in many cases, not all, but in many cases, um, it's possible to not only think about an object, but to see it or behold it, right? Yeah. And then we have, we've established the relation with the thing itself. Okay. And that's what givenness is. It's when we can point to something in our field of consciousness in the case of perception and say, yes, that is the very thing that is the, the target of my thought. Mm -hmm. um, so th those would be the clearest cases of, of givenness is to contrast it with non-givenness, right? So I can merely think about what, you know, my coat being in the closet. I can open up the closet and discover my coat to be there. And then the same phenomena, which was merely thought of is now given. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. So, so, um, holding that idea in your mind is, uh, it, it's not given to you, um, like your thoughts. Your thoughts might be given to you, but the object of thought isn't. So when I think that Vancouver, that it's raining right now in Vancouver, that state of affairs is not given to me, being where okay. I am. Right? Okay. I don't, I don't perceive it. What about um, what about you thinking that your toe is in pain after you stubbed it? Is yeah. that, the pain is given? Yeah. Well, uh, provided you're actually in pain. <laughs> I mean, you oh, might yeah. stub it and be anesthetized and not feel it. But I've oh, been sure, sure. an example that you stub it and actually feel the pain. Yeah. Okay. But, okay. Can you, this is so random, but can you be mistaken that you're in pain? Do you think? In the short term, I think it's possible. Okay. In the long term, where long means like five or 10 seconds, I'm yeah. not so sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, that... but I'm prepared to hear an argument to the sure. effect that, that, yeah. Okay. I, I mean, I think there's definitely cases where you can anticipate pain and think you felt pain. Like you might grab a pot and think it's hot. And yeah. Have this sort of oh i just burned myself and it's really cold right. or something yeah yeah okay but those errors seem to get corrected pretty quickly i can't imagine somebody being mistaken about being in a condition of sustained pain for five minutes and, and being wrong about that yeah but who knows maybe yeah well so um uh, i want to go going back to the givenness and like i want to get to like pure thought if we can but because you talk about in here how husserl there is some relation between Husserl and like Descartes, at least yeah. when, when it, I think when it comes to the cogito um, or cogito, if, if you're, I know you didn't want to do this. You didn't in the book, you're like, we don't have to go into these skeptical scenarios, but um, if let's just go with like the cogito, like I, I know that I'm thinking right now. Right. Is that, is that thought that I exist? I think therefore I am. Is that thought given to me? Yes. It is given to me. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the, the cogito there is this reflective act in which I'm reflecting on an, a, a, an occurrent or very recent okay. act of consciousness. 
So yes, it's it's a given. And not only is it given for Husserl, it's given in a very special way. It's given adequately. And this is true of all occurrent conscious phenomena is that they are either given or giveable in a way that's complete or adequate. Can, can you help me with given versus giveable? Well, something could be givable without being given. So the, the code in my closet is giveable insofar as it's a possible object of perception, but it's not actually uh, given to okay. me because I don't see it right now. Gotcha. When it comes to conscious states, I think they're always given, although there's a very, I don't know, there's, it's tricky how self-consciousness works. Yeah. Because most of my conscious states, at least on the view that I defend sort of in the book, is that my own current conscious states are not objects. So it's my own cur current conscious states are not given as objects. They don't stand over against me. They're given in a sort of non-intentional, non-representational way. And that is something I'm still trying to sort of make sense of because I feel okay. pushed to endorse that view. But at the same time, it's it's mysterious. Um, well, why wouldn't they be intentional? Well, they're not the objects of which I'm conscious. So right now, as I see the computer screen, yeah. But the object is the computer screen. My act of seeing is something that, that is conscious, and I'm conscious of it, but I'm not conscious of it as an object. Okay. In the way that I'm conscious of the computer screen as an object. Okay. Right. I can, through in an act of reflection, make my present experience an object. Right. Okay. So I think that I think the the way it works in Descartes is that I'm making my present act of thinking into an object in a mm -hmm. higher order act of reflection, so that my present conscious state is given to me as an object. Okay. And who's awesome. all think, yeah, who's all thinks that conscious states are, are given adequately or completely. But this is, this is an important distinction because, um, you know, I think there's a tendency, like, here's how I thought about it when I was an undergraduate. It's sort of mm -hmm. like, when I thought about the problem of the external world, I'm like, yeah, you know, I mean, my conscious states are better known than their physical objects. Like, yeah. if I, if I, if I have an experience in which I seem to see a coat in a closet, I'm pretty confident there's a coat in a closet, but I'm really confident that it seems to me as though there's a coat in the closet, right? Right. So if I had to place bets on which thing existed, knowing only one of them did, I'd put the money on my conscious state because I'm okay. more sure of its existence. And so I thought, yeah, you know, there's kind of an explanation. I mean, the coat is outside, it's external, yeah. and my conscious state is internal, and that's what grounds their knowability. I think for Husserl, the internal-external distinction has no epistemological importance at all. And he says so in the fifth logical investigation. The real reason mental states are better known than physical things is because physical things are always given inadequately and mental states are given adequately. So the inner outer distinction does no work. For it's the adequacy yeah. uh, distinction. Yeah. Well, what makes, uh, you said it, but I, already, I think I already lost it. What makes um, my thoughts more adequate, my thought of, the uh, coat being in the closet more adequate than the coat in the closet? The coat in the closet has um, unseen parts and sides. Okay. Oh, yeah. It's given from a perspective is to Perspectival, say, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's that it's given perspectively. So when I see the coat for Husserl, it's, uh, this involves what he calls a horizon. Okay. This horizon involves um, me mentally aiming, as it were, at unseen, unperceived portions of the coat. Okay. Um, the coat has further modes of givenness besides the one that I'm enjoying right now. Mm -hmm. And as a result, it could turn out that these sort of intentions towards the unseen, unperceived parts of the coat could be frustrated in the course of future experience. I might go out to grab it off the hook and my hand go right through. Right. And yeah, yeah, right yeah, yeah. Really a coat there, right? So they're yeah. capable of this sort of frustration. Whereas my own mental acts, my own conscious experiences don't have those kinds of hidden parts and sides. Okay. So, so I wonder, um, I think you're right. I think that's, that sounds really good, but I wonder about, um, there's someone told me this once that, uh, it's a mark of higher IQ if you're able to, uh, turn things in your mind. So if you look at like a trash can and you can close your eyes and imagine it turning, then it, you're smarter. So I do that all the time just to make sure that I can still do it. It's yeah, I have no I'm idea. actually terrible at it. So. <laughs> <laughs> so it may not be a mark of intelligence. After no, all. I'm like, trying. It probably is. And this is <laughs> confirming the theory. Well, so if I, I want to, um, when I think of my mental acts, uh, like the coat in the closet, my, my thought of that coat in the closet is of the front of the coat. But I can, 
isn't it still perspectival? Because I'm I'm usually just thinking about how it looks when I open up the door. But I can imagine twisting that or me me picking it up and turning it and looking at the back. Um, so I would think that the the mental act itself would also be perspectival, just like the the coat itself. Yeah. Well, in this case, you're involved. The act in question, uh, we're dealing with a couple of different mental acts when you okay. discuss this case, right? So you say the thought of the coat, but then you give a case where you're mentally rotating it. Yeah. Which for Husserl would be an act of imagination. And imagination ah. is not the same thing as thought. Okay. So I can think about a thing without imagining it. And I can think th about the very same coat as I mentally rotate it. Now, yeah. the act of imagination this is a series of imaginative acts where I view the coat, the imagined coat from different profiles, but the thought about the coat doesn't change. So the okay. thought can remain constant while the imagination changes and the imagination can remain constant while the thought changes. Cause I can have a static mental image of a coat and think about the coat and then change my thought too about its texture or about its color or about its shape. Oh yeah. So imagination and thought for Husserl, as for Descartes, actually, he makes this point in the sixth investigation, the sixth meditation, that they're, they're distinct acts. Um, it's easier to think about a thousand-sided figure, to give Descartes' example, than to imagine one. Ah, uh, that's helpful. So, so like, you, you can think of a square circle, but you can't imagine one? Would you say that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Husserl thinks that. That's okay. Right. Okay. Yep. And now let's go back to the claim. Isn't my, let's take the imaginative act. Now that yeah. we've distinguished those, the second claim you wanted to make was, well, look, maybe my imaginative act is given in profiles too, because after all, I'm rotating this thing. The rotated object is not the mental act of imagining it. So an imagined coat is also presented inadequately. Uh, the act of imagining it is not. The act isn't the thing that's rotating. Yeah, the act, that's good. Yeah, the act itself isn't colored. Uh, it's not rotating. It it's, yeah. Yeah. That's right. Does the act have any properties? Yeah, I mean, part of the task in this book of chapter two is to describe the actual properties of the act because it's so difficult to do. Yeah. So, I mean, here's a game you can play with your friends, right? Just go ask them to describe their experience of X. How to pick out anything, a coffee cup. Say, yeah. describe oh. your experience of the coffee cup. And I... I, I predict that in many cases, they'll start describing the coffee cup. Yeah. And then it'll be like, yeah, but I asked you to describe your experience and your experience doesn't have a handle and it's not full mm -hmm. of liquid and it's right. It doesn't weigh so and so many ounces. And so part of the task of chapter two is to figure out how to go about the business of describing mental acts. One thing you have to do to describe a mental act is you have to say something about its object. Yeah. Like you, you can't even get to square one in describing the consciousness of a cup if you don't avail yourself of specifying the, the, the act in questions of a cup. Yeah. But the second part is you could never fully describe an act of being conscious of a cup if all you describe is the cup. Right. So the way we do it, I think, and the way that Husserl is so skilled at doing it is not to simply gaze inward really hard and try to describe experiences. Yeah. It's to compare and contrast experiences which are directed upon the same objects. Yeah. So the way to just start describing experiences is let's compare and contrast the case of perceiving a cup versus merely thinking of a cup. Compare and contrast those with remembering a cup or imagining a cup or anticipating a cup or seeing a cup in an image. And once we start to elucidate the properties of those, I focus on four, which is pretty pretty standard, right? I focus on the intuitiveness versus the emptiness of an experience, yeah. right? Is it given, is, it, is, it, is the experience presentational or not? And, and if it's not presentational, it's empty. Yes. And if it is presentational, it's intuitive. Yes. And then you also have imaginative, um, imaginative, right? Imaginative acts fall under intuitive acts. Oh, okay. I didn't catch yeah, that. Imaginative okay. acts are a type of intuitive act. Gotcha. Okay. That's helpful. Because yeah. okay. they, they have this presentational character. But they're not, um, uh, as we just talked about, they're not, uh, I forgot the language, but they're, they're not, they don't present themselves adequately. No, in this case, what the difference between imagination and perception on Husserl's account is that perception is what he calls originary. It's the mode of consciousness in which the thing itself is present. Ah, okay. But not an imagination. And not an imagination. that, even though it sounds tough, makes total sense because that's just, just think about it. <laughs> like I can think yeah. about the Eiffel Tower right now, but it's not presenting itself to me as if I went and saw and stood yeah. in front of the Eiffel Tower. That's right. Okay. Yeah. This is good. This is helpful.
So now we're starting to describe the properties of the act. So you, you can know that an act is originary or not. You can know if it's intuitive or not. You can know if it's of the Eiffel Tower as opposed to of, say, I don't know, the Golden Gate Bridge. So these are some of the features that we can start describing as yeah. phenomenologists. That's so good. I um I didn't get there's there's it was so good. I had to read reread um, different portions of this again, but I, I so I didn't get to think about the knowledge portion as much as I wanted to. But um, when it comes to like originary, uh, if if I went to France and uh, you know the Eiffel Tower is presenting itself to me, but unbeknownst to me, you know I'm at a distance. It's actually a cardboard cutout yeah. in in front of the Eiffel Tower. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I think that it's originary, but it's really a cardboard cutout of the Eiffel Tower that's presenting itself to me. Um, do we get into like Gettier style cases here? Does, yeah. is, is there room for that in phenomenology? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, what's happening in this case is that you are having an originary perceptual experience of a cardboard cutout. Yeah. Your mistake is not a... So something's going wrong, right? You end up yeah. with a false belief. The false right. belief is that's the Eiffel Tower. Mm -hmm. And now let's look at the sources of how this belief went wrong. Are you suffering a perceptual illusion or hallucination? Mm. Or is it some other kind of error? Yeah. Now, the answer that I think is the right answer is that your perception is working just fine. Mm -hmm. And this happens in the case of a lot of replicas. And I mean, right, the reason people mistake decoys for ducks isn't because they're perceived wrongly. It's because they're perceiving correctly. Yeah. The decoys look like ducks. Right. Right. They wouldn't work as well with, you know, entities whose perceptual faculties weren't working that well. Yeah. What's happening here is a case of misidentification. Mm. So in the case of what Husserl calls fulfillment, fulfillment is a way more complicated experience than perception. Okay. In fulfillment, we both have the thing given and we think about it. Okay. In this case, the thing you're thinking about is the Eiffel Tower. The thing which is given is the cardboard cutout. And yeah. so this is a case of misrecognition or failure of fulfillment. It's not a case of perceptual error. Does fulfillment require um, self-consciousness as well? All of these acts require self-consciousness gotcha. in the most primitive sense of you have to be aware of the act itself in some okay. manner or another. Right? Okay. That's really helpful. And, and that was another like really um, surprising, uh, a really good surprise to find because I, I care so much about self-consciousness and uh, studying philosophy of mind type stuff. I hear consciousness a lot and I'm like, who cares? Consciousness is cool, but I want self-conscious. I want self-awareness. I want to talk about that because I think that's so important for what it means to be human uh, and distinguishing. I got my puppy sitting here and yeah. I don't I don't know what what his level of self-consciousness is. You know, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think he has. He definitely doesn't have what we have. And so that's, he might that's not what have what we about. have. Yeah. But, you know, I'm, I'm persuaded by the work of people like, I know, Dan Zahavi and Evan Thompson and others who would point out that any consciousness involves some degree of self-consciousness because one thing your dog can do is it can distinguish whether an object is moving or whether it's moving. Yeah. If it had no awareness whatsoever, it wouldn't know whether the ball is coming towards it or it's going towards the it ball. It couldn't catch the ball. Yeah. That's interesting. Well, so yeah. even just basic perceptual faculties of dis distinguishing between changes in the world and changes in our orientation or position, they argue require some degree of self-awareness does that self-awareness require a concept of self of, I don't think like it requires okay so that's i don't think so and I, I don't think it does on say zahavi's view which is Do the you, one that i'm most attracted to okay so so like my my puppy over here he probably doesn't have a concept of like an ego or his own self he may or may not i, I don't like to speculate too much on them <laughs> because the more we learn about them right the more surprising they are it's that's true that's true and, and yeah i don't know don't, yeah, we just got a dog a couple of years ago, like got on the COVID bandwagon. And got yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's great. I'm always, I'm always impressed by this. Thing. It sometimes acts like it has an abiding self. Yeah. I mean, it has it's memories. Like, it freaks me out because I don't know how to deal with that. Yeah, I, I love it when I'm playing with them. But then when I go and I sit in my armchair and I look at them, I'm like, what's going on in this guy's head right now? Yeah, like I don't think my dog is sitting down and mapping out a 10-year plan. Yeah. But on the other hand... It seems to be more excited to see you if more time has elapsed and if less time has elapsed. That's right. Yeah. Um, it has a complex representational life that spans more than the present moment of time in which it's existing. Yeah. That's that's true. Man. 
So okay. I, don't, I don't know. I mean, yeah. other people have thought way more deeply about this than I have, but it seems to have a, a much more complex representational life than I think I was inclined to think dogs had prior to actually having one and yeah, as a, as a companion. Okay. Um, I want to, I want to, I think I want to jump back on that, but first I want to get to, um, we've already kind of broached it a little bit, I think, but, uh, uh, transparency and, and consciousness and how, um, if consciousness is transparent, why that might be a problem for phenomenology. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So why, why think, why would someone think that consciousness is transparent? And then just what, what does that mean for the listeners who, who haven't read the book? Well, I think the transparency thesis is one that a lot of people are really attracted to. Mm -hmm. And it goes something like this. Look, well, it goes back to the, the prediction I make about what's going to happen if you ask your friend to describe right. the cop, the, their experience of the cop. And, you know, as Gilbert Harmon and others point out, they'll start describing the cop, mm -hmm. right? Go ahead and describe the tree in front of you. Now describe your experience of the tree in front of you. And Harmon says, hey, you know, I predict the only features you're going to find there to describe are features of the tree. Yeah, I think a lot of people think that that's the case. And you know, I, the first person I know who really made this point was G.E. Moore. Yeah, in his 1903, I think that's the year, refutation of idealism paper, where he points out the diaphanousness of consciousness. Yeah. Um, well, you know, certainly consciousness doesn't seem to have any of the familiar primary and secondary qualities that that you know philosophers are often interested in. They don't seem to be spatially extended. They don't have mass or weight. They don't seem to have color, smell, texture. Right. And if that's what's in our field of consciousness, it looks like that the experience itself is something that just is not there in the field of consciousness as an, as an item of awareness. Yeah. And I think there's some, I mean, there's something to the transparency thesis insofar as one of the tasks of my experiential life and my experiences is to step out of the way to make objects available to me. Yeah. The way Husserl describes it is, look, we live a life of infatuation with the world and the objects in the world. It's actually a very unnatural enterprise to turn our attention to the acts of consciousness in which the world is made present to us. Well, and and, and even just a practical note, if, if a car is barreling down on you, it, it makes more sense to focus on the car and get out of the way than be like, well, I'm trying to wade through my phenomenology. So yeah, sure that yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. The task of, you know, our evolved system of representing the world is to make us aware of and respond to the world like right. that. Yeah. Not primarily make us aware of our own experiences. Yeah. It's very, you know, so m maybe one way to contrast it and other authors have done this, right, is to look at representations which don't exhibit transparency. Mm -hmm. So paintings and words, right, images and symbols are non-transparent representations. So if you ask me, right, if we use the word Husserl, we'll probably be using the word rather than mentioning it. We'll be talking about Edmund Husserl. But yeah. we can really quite easily turn our attention to the sign itself and start describing its properties. Like it just begins need with some H. quotations, yeah. Well, you just need quotations. And now, yeah. right, Husserl doesn't begin with H, but Husserl begins with H. Yeah. Very easy to do. We can describe its features. We can do the same thing with paintings. Consciousness to many does not seem like paintings or words. It doesn't seem like something you can just throw into the field of sense perceptible realities and survey it. Right. Yeah, yeah. So in that, well, however phenomenological reflection works, it doesn't work in the same sort of obvious, super easy way that attending to a word, a sign or an image works. Yeah. So what's the problem with why does transparency pose a problem for phenomenology? I guess the problem, the worry that as I see it is that if phenomenology is supposed to be describing and in whose it is, the structure of consciousness, conscious experiences as they're given. And if those experiences are transparent, then there's really nothing that we're capable of describing. I mean, right. either they have such a structure and the method of phenomenology gives us no access to them, or they simply don't have a structure at all, which it really seems to be Sartre's view, for instance, hmm. in, in which case phenomenology is not in the business of describing the, the structures of consciousness at all. And then we're just describing cups. We're just describing trees. Yeah. There's nothing over and above. Or, and that's like horn one of the dilemma, the, the yeah. horn two is like, well, there's something there, but it's so complex that uh, the phenomenologist can't describe. Yeah, not even complex, just hidden. Just We just don't oh, have oh, access oh. to it, right? Okay. And that would be the task of some other discipline, probably one of the, co you know, cognitive science sure. to describe it. Right? Okay, okay. So, that, so that's why transparent, because I guess, I don't know, just in, initially someone might be thinking that transparency, transparency is a really good thing because it 
shows that we are uh, highly attuned or evolved or designed to uh, our, our cognitive faculties are highly attuned or designed or evolved to uh, manipulate the world, to yeah. interact with the world. And so it's like uh, intuitively, yeah, maybe we'd want it to be transparent. But then um, you give some arguments for why it isn't. Is there any, b before we get to that, um, is there any problem uh, for the for the phenomenologist? It's like, well, then we don't have a job to do. And that's a problem. But or what it'd about be a different job. I mean, I think, it, oh, I, think okay. it, I think the way I framed it in the book is it's a dilemma for phenomenology. I think it's really a dilemma for a certain Husserlian brand of phenomenology. Oh, yeah. Because you said, you said Sartre. Uh, yeah, Sartre is somebody with phenomenology and he sure. really, he, he's doing good phenomenology at his best. Okay. At least some of the time. Okay. And he's not doing exactly what Husserl says we should be okay. doing. He's right. Okay. Um, because he's not articulating the makeup of consciousness as such in yeah. terms of its contents and so forth. Yeah. Um, at least not always. Um, okay. yeah. So maybe it's not a dilemma for phenomenology under a very broad construal. Yeah. But I think it definitely spells trouble for the Husserlian conception of phenomenology, okay. where it's in virtue of the nature, properties, and structures of conscious acts that objects appear or not in the precise manner that they do. Okay. And the task of phenomenology is to describe the features of acts in virtue of which objects show up or not yeah. in the manners that they do. Yeah. And so so then to, to combat um, this dilemma, that's when you go with the empty intuitive uh, experience, right? You said there's a distinction between empty and, and intuitive yeah, yeah, experience. Yeah. Which Evan Thompson and Jan Allman have already pointed out right so that's this argument's due to them and i think both of them okay. are right okay they both develop the argument as far as i can tell independently and uh, and probably other phenomenologists have developed it as well yeah it's that look um the most fundamental distinction and actually this is very interesting to me i think for Husserl, the most fundamental distinction in phenomenology and in epistemology is the distinction between empty and intuitive or filled experiences yeah empty. so there is a massive difference in both the phenomenal character and the epistemic worth of merely thinking that my coat is in the closet and seeing my coat in the closet. Yeah. That distinction is not a distinction in the object. So if we think of consciousness of, right, mm -hmm. we, have the, we have the left hand side of the consciousness of relation and we have the right yeah. hand side where the object lives. Transparency is the thesis that all differences among mental states are differences on the right hand side of the consciousness of relation. And the Husserlian yeah. argument, nicely stated by Thompson and Alming, is that you could never fully describe consciousness by sticking to what's on the object side. Describe the object of which you're conscious down to the tiniest detail. And the question is, are you merely thinking of it or are you perceiving it? Hmm. Are you perceiving it or are you imagining it? Are you imagining it or are you seeing an image of it? All of those distinctions are distinctions on the left-hand side of yeah. the consciousness of relation. They're not distinction in the object. Yeah. that's And, and you could bring in two different perceivers. And if there's discrepancy... It's probably in the perspective or in the perceiver, and it's probably probably not in the thing in the object, right? Well, the discrepancy probably couldn't be in the object if it's the yeah. same object at the same time, right? Otherwise, right. it have contradictory properties, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, I don't know if if this is in the literature or not, but I, I was thinking of like Monet and like Impressionism, and um, some people have said like, "Man, look at this guy; he's drawn the same hay bale, blah blah blah." But it's like that; it's a it's interesting because he's kind of making the same point where it's like he's drawing this hay bale, but now it's he's drawing at different times of the day. And sure. it's it's cool. It's like, yeah, there's there's something on this side of, of the line. It's not on the object side. I know well, that the, the sun's changing, so maybe the color's changing and stuff. Too, well, that's just it. I, I yeah. think you just gave the answer. Okay. So the, the, the transparency theorist, I don't think, is going to be overly troubled by that example because they will say, well, although the hay bale is a common object among all these different representations, the total object of the representation is not the same because we yeah. have different conditions of illumination. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So. So they, they have resources to respond to that. Yeah. Yeah. Do, how, how much does, um, how much does like feelings uh, come into play here? Like when, when I look at the coffee mug, um, when I look at my coffee mug, like this is, it has my logo on it and stuff and it's cool. And I think of the, my friend <laughs> Jordan who, who designed that and stuff. Yeah. And, yeah. I, I have all these, it's, it's, it's pr like preloaded with all sorts of emotions that I think of it too. Does that play any role in, in, um, is that, is there any kind of argument there against, uh, intentionalism 
um, from from emotions? Maybe, but an intentionalist is probably going to say that emotions are ways of representing objects. So one intentionalist response might be that emotions are ways of representing their value properties. Right. But if we have different value properties, you look at the mug and you see something different than I see, right? That's right, but you don't need to regard the value properties as intrinsic. You could regard them ah. as it's it's important to me. Gotcha. Right. Just like yeah. if I see something, if I see the lamp from three feet away and you see it from six feet away, there's no contradiction there because part of what I'm representing is the lamp as being three feet away. Yeah. The intentionalist can handle differences like that. So I think That's they could be able to handle these emotional cases too. Provided that we equip emotions with intentionality. And okay. I think we should. I think there's yeah. a big difference between emotions like resentment or forgiveness or fondness versus an itch or a tickle. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, that's good. Thanks. Thanks for like, yeah, souping up the intentionalist side a little bit more. I, I was, I don't know. I didn't have a. I think a it's actually a view. plausible view. I mean, I, I, I think it's a serious view. And I actually, on one understanding of intentionalism, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds here. Sure. If we say that two acts which have different objects have to differ in their phenomenal character mm -hmm. or different acts with different phenomenal characters have to have different objects i think that view is probably bad news yeah but well let me think about this what i call object intentionalism seems like the wrong view okay the content intentional content that, yeah. that the phenomenal character supervenes on the content of a state on its complex intentionality, not just its object, but its content, which specifies the manner in which we're conscious of it. I actually think that's that's a fairly credible view. So okay. given, the, given the Husserlian theory of content, content intentionalism comes, I think, pretty close to being a plausible view. Not all the way, I think, but... Okay. Uh, when I think of uh, content intentionalism, um, you say it's determined by the content and not just the object. And so sure. I, I, I imagine that there's probably different degrees uh to content in intentionalism that some could say some some might not include the object at all whereas others say you know it has to um it's it's determined by the content and you know 50 percent of the object or something do, do yeah yeah the distinction i'm getting at yeah no i i think i think that's where we get into all kinds of difficult issues okay um in the case of veridical perception mm -hmm. the content of course specifies which object is perceived yeah. And so the object is definitely playing a role in the constitution of that mental state because that mental state could not exist if its object didn't on the view I want to defend. Is it a causal role? Uh, no, it's, it's a constitutive role. I mean, it's, it, it involves causation too, but it involves this more intimate relation of just intentionality. The content yeah. of this act prescribes that object and no other. That's, this, is, this is something that has been really hard for me to wrap my head around lately. Um, because uh, I studied a lot of like Donald Davidson and his tri triangulation argument, and he goes in for content externalism, and he he he's doing this because he wants to close any kind of gap between mm -hmm. our, our our thoughts and our our concepts and the things of which they're supposed to be about. Right. And so he, he but he goes in for this causal story, right. and he's like, look, uh, there's there's a three way relation. Uh, you when you first have a concept of a table, your your mom or teacher whoever teaches you about table you eventually abstract out the concept table and you see it applies to different types of tables and therefore there can't be any uh there's no room for skepticism in there but uh you know brandon has hammered me about uh, uh causal causal stories and you don't go in for causal stories no. um so davidson's like well if there's any kind of gap then you have you have skepticism can sneak in now because if your concept isn't caused by the table and the the person using the word table teaching you then um if it's just constituted by it then what if all of our concepts since they're not caused by the things the things of the world what if they're not veridical yeah what, what, what do we do with that i don't know it seems to me that constitution is a more intimate relation than causation because causation I, I think the word the I don't have a problem with the idea that an essential part of ordinary perception of physical things is that they stand in a causal relation yeah. to, our, to, our, to our sense organs. But I don't think that's what explains the essential character of perception. And what I like about what I don't like about the causal story is that it, insofar as causal relations are contingent, it makes my concept of a table only contingently refer to tables, as if my concept table could have been about trees. But it seems to me that 
one insight we get from Husserl, and I get this from Dallas even more directly, because yeah. the concepts don't just happen to be about the things they're about. They're not like words. The word table could have referred to anything. Right. But I don't think the concept table could have been of something else. It just would have been a different concept. Yeah. Is that what because... was something much more robust than a causal relationship? Yeah. But then, so, I, and I, I want, I want to go with you. I like that. And so I need to, I'm, I've been thinking about it more and I see it in your book. So I, I need to reread and reread more. But um, when it go, when it comes to content and concepts and, you know, the relation between propositions and states of affairs, are, are cons, I know like, like Frege thought concepts were like universals. Mm -hmm. um, does Husserl think that? Like what, if a concept yes. couldn't, he does think that. Mm -hmm. But and they so, don't think they're the same as the universals that they refer to in all cases. Concept, so the okay. concept red is one universal and the color red is a different universal. Oh, interesting. And yeah. is the content of the concept red, the property red? The object is the way I would like to talk about it. Do concepts have content? If they have concepts as constituents, if they're complex. Oh, yeah. Because yeah, Concepts you can... just are a type of content. Gotcha. So you can you can go in for complex or simple concepts on this field. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. And then, um, so how about thoughts? Are thoughts are thoughts built up from concepts? Well, do you mean thoughts in Frege's sense or thoughts in in the sense of an act of thinking? Because what Frege means by a thought is what Husserl calls a proposition. Right. So not not in the not in the Frege, uh, Fregean sense, but in the in the. I guess I didn't know. I don't know the distinction between Husserl's uh, view of thought and uh, Frege's. I think Husserl is probably more like common sense, how we talk about thoughts, like an act of Yeah, of I, I think so. I think the term might just be ambiguous. I mean, oh, okay. sometimes we could say, yeah. I, well, I don't that. know. I don't know a ton of people who think that thoughts are what Frege describes as thoughts, <laughs> right? Maybe not. Yeah. Although people say things like, here's the thought. And, yeah, oh, I yeah. Thought. I mean, that's a good point. That's a good point. Well, yeah. I mean, I, th I, th I think the term sometimes admits of a Frigean reading where it means something like a, a judgment or a proposition. Or okay. Something like that. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. If we're talking about acts of thinking, they yeah. are not composed of concepts. They're composed of the ontology is they're composed of what he calls a matter and a quality. And okay. the matter of an act is the instantiation of, in the case of a thought, concepts. It's an instantiation of a concept. Yeah, so he believes in property instances or tropes. So he thinks that, for instance, the Eiffel Tower not only instantiates a, a universal shape that could in principle be instantiated by a lot of different things, but that it has its own shape moment, which is as individual as the Eiffel Tower itself. If, if the Eiffel Tower got destroyed, its shape moment or shape part, it's a non-separable part, okay. part, abstract part. And that's in time and space, wherever the oh, this is towers are located. Logic. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. This part is in time and space. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. So we think thoughts have the same thing. They have what's called a matter. The matter determines which object is represented, and the mode of presentation of the object. What Frege would call the sense. Okay. The matter of an act. So you and I can both think that the Eiffel Tower is whatever a thousand feet tall. Mm -hmm. Both of us are thinking uh, the same proposition. Yep. But there are two acts of thought taking place, and the matter of your act of thought is a distinct thing than the matter of my act of thought, but they share the same properties. That yeah. property is a is a, a proposition. Propositions and concepts which compose them are instantiated in acts of thinking. Okay. I'm I I get it. I get everything except where the concepts are playing in in, in uh be, between our, our two different mental acts. With the concepts being instantiated, uh twice once by me once by you yeah just in the same way that if i have two red cubes redness is instantiated twice in two okay. red cubes. but the the proposition the pro propositions aren't instantiated right like they're they are they are instantiated. At least on the account that i like in husserl's first investigation okay yeah propositions are multiply instantiable then yeah gotcha so they're not so the the question we'd ask is you know thinking in a husserlian vein in this light is when I think about the Eiffel Tower being a thousand feet tall, what is the object of my thought? What's the full object? Yeah. And his answer is the full object is not the Eiffel Tower. It's the state of affairs of the Eiffel Tower as being a thousand feet tall. That's yeah. the full complete object of this thought. That's a state of affairs which has constituents like the Eiffel Tower. Mm -hmm. The proposition represents the Eiffel Tower as being a thousand feet tall. 
It yeah. doesn't consist of the Eiffel Tower. Its constituent is the concept that refers to the Eiffel Tower and, and the concept and, of being a thousand feet. Now, is that proposition on the object side or not when we think that the Eiffel Tower is a thousand feet tall? And Husserl's claim is we don't make objects, we don't make meanings into objects when we use them. Interesting. So I don't think about the proposition when I'm when I'm thinking it. I'm thinking yeah. directly. Oh yeah. In a mediated yeah. way about the Eiffel Tower being a thousand feet tall. But if we focus our attention on the mental act itself, do we turn that thought into an object? Yes, and we can also turn the proposition into an object as we're doing it right now. Awesome. That's Anything awesome. can be turned into an object in principle, but yeah. it would require a new mental act. Yeah. Right. Uh, like a high, does it go higher? Is it higher order? It could be higher order. It could just be an act of logical reflection when we okay. come to the case of thinking about the proposition. So reflecting on my act of thinking about the proposition is a distinct thing than reflecting on the proposition. Okay. Yeah. Um, and and when we do that, when we turn our attention to think on the thought itself, does that, I, I keep forgetting the terminology, does that make it more, um, oh, shoot, does that make it more, the, the, you made this distinction between um, uh, the coat in the closet versus my thought of the coat in the closet, and my thought is more, it presents itself. Yeah, adequately. Adequately. Ad, it adequately presents itself. So does that play in here? If we're, if we're thinking about the thought about the Eiffel Tower, is that presented to us more adequately than the thought about the Eiffel Tower on the first level or whatever, the non-reflective? It's presented more adequately than the Eiffel Tower. Okay. Right? Okay. And it, if if I shift from the first order act of thinking about the Eiffel Tower to a yep. second order act, what's happening in the second order act is that I'm thematizing and attending to various features of my thought. Yeah, that'd be like quoting it, right? It's, in a it's like the use use first mention distinction, kind yeah. of, but, but for your thoughts. Yes. Yeah. That's 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 what it is. That's awesome. This or, is so cool. This is so cool. The something that makes me a little bit sad here is that um, it seems like. If there wasn't a hard split, and maybe there wasn't a hard split, I don't know the history or whatever that well, but if phenomenology had stayed more mainstream with analytic philosophy, then maybe our philosophy of mind would be like orders of magnitude uh, further along than it is now. Maybe it might be further along. I think it would be different. You know, I think it would yeah. be further along on the descriptive side. I don't know if it would be further along in terms of solving some of the central problems of the philosophy of mind. Like yeah. I just don't have an answer to the mind-body problem, for instance. I yeah. mean, some of these deep metaphysical issues. Well, I but can... if we're if we're so uh, from, I know John Searle is not. He's it's he is uh, he is not uh, supposed to be named because he's yeah. But he in in several talks he's talked about how you know when he first started getting into consciousness stuff it was really taboo to talk mm -hmm. about at least in the you know popular philosophy. Yeah however popular analytic philosophy is. Um, and so, you know, if, if it just wouldn't have been taboo ever and right. consciousness and intentionality were always on the table and everyone was, they're still getting funded for talking about it, maybe we'd be, you know, further along. Yeah, I think you have a good point there. Yeah, yeah. if there wasn't, you know, several decades of yeah. consciousness neglect taking yeah. place. Yeah, it's the, really it's the Vienna school. Well, we can blame them. Yeah. If we have to blame someone. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, so, so um, I, I really, the, the, the meanings is, is really interesting. And I really like, really like thinking about uh, Frege and, uh, and Husserl and, and their idea of meanings and concepts that, that all is so, so beneficial and so helpful to me. Um, when and it comes to views are importantly different. I right. Mean, yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's what's helpful. Cause I, I think I understand Frege a little bit better. And so when if I can say, oh, here's how Husserl is different, then it helps me understand Husserl better. Yeah. I mean, I think Dallas Willard has a couple of good papers on Frege and Husserl. Okay. And ultimately, oh, wow. I, didn't know that. I mean, yeah, I mean, ultimately, I think I think Dallas's criticism of Frege is that insofar as he says anything informative at all about the relationship between an act of meaning and a meaning, he calls it grasping, which gives us the wrong idea that a meaning is something which is the intentional object of an act of meaning. Yeah. But when I think that the Eiffel Tower is tall, what I'm thinking about is not a meaning or a proposition. I'm using the concepts, but not thinking about them.
Because for for Willard, is that, and maybe Husserl, probably he's following him, is that because intentionality doesn't have to have two relata? It's not just because of that. It's okay. because of a straightforward, I think, for, for Dallas and for Husserl, it's in part just because of a straightforward empir- um, phenomenological fact, which is that when I'm thinking about the Eiffel Tower, that's what I'm thinking of, I'm not thinking about the concept of the Eiffel Tower. Is there a problem if we if we were just thinking about the concept of an Eiffel Tower? Does that mess with our direct like our, our idea of direct realism? Is that would that trap us in our head? Maybe it wouldn't trap us, but it would make it indirect. But don't, but it's I think it's a mistake to think that indirectness is the same as being trapped. Okay. Okay. Like I'm not trapped when I see a picture of Joe Biden in the <laughs> picture. Yeah. Even though image consciousness is a case, definitely right of indirect yeah. awareness. I'm aware of Joe Biden when I see a picture of Joe Biden in yeah. virtue of seeing an image and taking it as a representation of Joe Biden. So, yeah. but I, I don't think that that's a form of entrapment. You okay. can learn a lot from images about that's the re- that they're images of. That's really helpful. So yeah, well, if, if, the, if the only immediate objects of consciousness were concepts or more broadly con- mental contents, then yeah, that would that would be incompatible with direct realism, but it need not be a skeptical position by any means because the directness relation might not be doing, might not be essential as a knowledge gathering relation because we gather knowledge through images all the time. Well, yeah. So I guess what I was thinking of is like going back to Kant's transcendental idealism. It's like, how do we know if, if it's all indirect, how do we know that there are things in themselves? You know, if, 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 if all we're seeing is the, the, uh, if we don't ever see the noumena and we, all we see is like the phenomena, how do we know there's anything out there even producing the phenomena? What if, you know, if we're just sitting in a void, just hallucinating? Yeah, I don't have a good answer for that from Kant's point of view. Right? Yeah. Well, there's so a, that's what I'm thinking about indirectness. So yeah. uh, we don't, don't we want something to, to be producing? Not producing because, uh, you know, I don't want to get back into the causal theory. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's not clear that Kant's problem, the problem with Kant's epistemology is... That the proper way to think about it is in terms of indirectness. Okay. I think it's the I think it's the pr- the problem of deciphering any intelligible relation whatsoever between what he calls phenomena and what he calls noumena. Yeah. Because he hammered that distinction so hard. Yeah, I mean, what is exactly the relation between them? Is yeah. it representation? <laughs> like, I mean, what what if a table, and remember the full table, the thing that presents itself from a possible infinity of profiles. That thing is a phenomenon in Kant's view. Okay. It's it's an appearance, is the translation. Hmm. What's it an appearance of? Yeah. It's not a representation. Okay. So we're we're definitely not dealing with something that when I see a table, I don't take it to be a representation of some other thing. Yeah. Especially not something which doesn't exist in time or space. Yeah. Like I'm not about to tell my children, well, what you're calling tables are just appearances of tables. Real tables don't occupy space, and real cows don't moo. I, I don't know what to make of a position like that. I, I think right. Kant's position is more complicated than that. I think it generates problems of knowledge of noumena, which are much more severe and serious than would be generated just by a form of indirect realism. Okay. I mean, I don't go in for indirect realism. For right, indirect right. Realism, but I don't think that in a version of indirect realism is straight away going to lead to a problem of knowledge that's as severe as what it is for Kant. Okay. And the that's, reason, I guess, if helpful. you could put it this in Husserlian terms, would be that for Kant, noumena simply aren't givable in intuition at all. Yeah. Whereas to be givable indirectly in intuition is still a way of being given an intuition. Okay. Okay. So um, when it comes to the to go back to to transcendental phenomenology i love the word transcendental i love transcendental deductions and all that oh i i hate it yeah so okay well i wanted to disagree uh, (laughs) that's great maybe you could disabuse me of it but (laughs) why i know for kant you know he goes in for like you know uh the the transcendental unity of apperception and stuff like that because he doesn't directly know the self but he knows it because he needs this unified apperception uh what's transcendental about about Husserl's transcendental phenomenology. Why, why Why is that term still there, I guess? Yeah, yeah, what a great question. I, I don't know. I, David Woodruff Smith said something funny once in conversation. He said, well, whatever else Husserl means by transcendental, he means really important. 
<laughs> and oftentimes I just read endlessly description, the, the term transcendental showing up in both Husserl's writing and in secondary literature. Yeah. There's no real description of, of what it means. I think it just means what Kant means. It's an ink, a transcendental investigation is concerned not so much with the objects of thought and knowledge, but with our mode of access to them, especially insofar as that mode of access is to be knowable a priori. What okay. I think Kant, what the, the main meaning of transcendental is that Husserl is concerned with the essential conditions for the possibility of representation and knowledge. There we go. We're looking for a set of non-accidental connections yeah. that make this conscious act that I'm having right now of the Eiffel Tower, right? And the other mental acts and the contents of those acts and the objects and how those things are all essentially connected with one another. Yeah. That's good. That's the that... one meaning. The other meaning I like is an older medieval sense. And yeah, really, I guess David beauty. Gordon Smith. Yeah. And yeah. Through, through Robert Sokolowski, which is that what transcendental phenomenology discloses is not just the nature of consciousness. It discloses a feature of objects as well. Yeah. Namely their intelligibility. I, I love that. I, so that's why I like the term, because I, I, I'd love to, to, to see those unified like you just did. That's fantastic. Um, yeah. So that's the medieval it's... sense of a transcendental, right? right. A, right. a feature that goes across all the Aristotelian categories of being. Yeah, it's which so is, good. You know, what Aquinas calls intrinsic intelligibility mm -hmm. or giveability or intuitability in Husserl's. Okay. Play. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Giveability. Okay. Making that connection is helpful. That's good. Okay. But to be is a, to be for Husserl, I think, is to be a possible object of knowledge. Okay. And to be a possible object of knowledge ultimately is to be a possible object of evident knowledge, which is given this. Well, so what about like a square circle? Is that not a possible object of knowledge? Okay. I mean, I can... you know, negative things about it, like that it's impossible. Okay. I can, I can think about it, but I uh -huh. can't imagine it. Right. Yeah. There's no fulfilling sense in Husserl's term corresponding with it. It's a meaning formation, which permits of no possibility of finding the thing itself. Okay. So there's no possibility of having that thing exhibited in an originary act of intuition. Okay. And or even no, a non-originary one like imagination. Is is a square circle? Um, is that? Is that? I don't even know if I can call it an idea. Is it? Is it an idea? Is it a concept? It's an inauthentic concept. It's a complex concept. Is it a? Is it made up of square and circle and like negation, yeah. or something? Well, a square circle is just made up of square and circle. I mean, okay. It sounds like when we do it, we're predicating squareness of a, of a circle. Yeah. And or so, circleness of a square, I guess. Yeah. Depending on how you say it. Depending on how you say it, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a complex meaning formation. That fails or something. That fails, yeah. Okay. For Husserl, I think the reason this is possible is because the, the laws of concept formation are purely formal. Yeah. And this is something he, this is a point he makes in his fourth logical investigations. In a fourth <laughs> logical investigation. So, you're right. If yeah. we have a noun and we have a verb phrase, right? The Eiffel Tower is tall. We can substitute any noun for the Eiffel Tower and yeah. still have something which makes grammatical sense. The yep. number two is tall. Justice <laughs> is tall. Yeah. Now, he distinguishes between nonsense and countersense. Some of these thoughts might be countersensical, meaning they're impossible and incapable of ever being fulfilled. But that's very different from a thought like ni or is, <laughs> which that's is not even well constructed grammatically. Okay. So, in, so it's because of this, and the sixth logical investigation makes this tolerably clear. It's because acts of meaning can be put together, or sorry, meanings can be combined according to purely formal rules. That, in his words, the sphere of meaning is vastly more expansive than the sphere of possible intuition. Mm. And this is what makes representing impossibilities possible. So we gotcha. can think about impossible objects. We can't imagine them. And... We can have the meaning intentions fulfilled. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Fulfillment. All it, it comes back to fulfillment there. Okay. For Husserl, it all does. I mean, this yeah. is ultimately the the cornerstone of his whole theory of knowledge and intentionality. Okay. Hmm. Well, another thing I really appreciate about Husserl is it seems like he is giving the mind its due. That, like, our minds are really special and they can grasp these laws that are non-spatial and like you know in this other realm like yeah. the human minds are, it's a big deal it's a really cool thing to, yeah, to investigate yeah, yeah and it's worth it's in, in like even like think about fulfillment and knowledge and consciousness it just he's taking it seriously and i love 
when philosophers do that because there's a lot of philosophers who don't do that and who want to poo-poo uh, our mind and just kind of overly naturalize a lot of our stuff, I think. And I don't think Husserl goes in for that. You know, maybe, and, and you know, naturalism is such a moving target that it's hard sure. to just simply say that Husserl is giving us a non-naturalistic theory. On his fairly narrow conception of what naturalism is, he thinks naturalism is false because it simply can't acknowledge the being of ideal entities like numbers and states of affairs and so forth. And right. we, yeah. And it can't understand the essential connections which are constitutive of intentionality. Yeah. It's always going to turn them into merely causal connections. And yeah. that, he thinks, is going to result in the real skepticism. In fact, it's okay. interesting to circle back to Davidson. The causal connection between an act and its object for Husserl, if that's the loose connection, we're never going to get a non-skeptical view of our knowledge of the world. Because All we're going to have is a theory of, like, what's a table? Uh, it's something out there which is causing various affectations in me just causing various responses uh, it's quite yeah. possible something besides a table could have caused me to have just these same appearances i think for Husserl, once you reduce intentionality to nothing more than causal re relationships you're yeah. going to end up in a skeptical scenario pretty quickly but i yeah. do think that what's interesting about Husserl, back to the point you made is just yeah. the point about taking it seriously this is part of the attraction i think of phenomenology to me mm -hmm. is that um I don't know. I, I don't have to fake it. I don't have to fake it, pretend that I believe in things I don't believe in or that yeah. I disbelieve in things that are present to me in my experience. If consciousness yeah. is there and if the objects of consciousness are there, if I live in a world that's saturated with value, I'm faking it if I pretend to be a value nihilist. Like I'm just pretending. And what I like about phenomenology, I guess, is that it provides enough of a framework to authorize me and others in taking things to be as they appear to be, at yeah. least until really, really good evidence is there to suppose they're not really there. Yeah. And to take the world to be the rich place that it appears to be and not to hold every item that I'm conscious of up against some worldview and see whether it fits with that worldview or not. Yeah, It just seems like it makes sense of a kind of epistemic progression, which is that it's easier to know about small stuff than to have a theory of everything. Yeah. And a lot of philosophy proceeds with a background theory of everything. In your example, naturalism. Yeah. I don't know how anyone could possibly know naturalism is true without knowing tons about specific subject matters. But the way to know about specific subject matters is to describe them in detail. Let's yeah. describe consciousness first and then ask the question of whether the thing we've accurately described is reducible to something else or not. Yeah. Rather than insisting that it must be reducible and simply ignoring all the things that somebody like Husserl has to say about it. It, it it seems like it comes back to like like Chisholm's distinction. I do this in almost all my episodes, but between um, uh, particularism and methodism. And if you're bringing this method to the thing, and everything has to fit in here, you're going to exclude some stuff. But if you go with the particularism, you take what's what's given, uh, and you and you try to build up from there. Yeah, no, I I totally agree with the particularist approach in this okay. way. That's what I take one of the joys of phenomenology to be. I will yeah. say that Husserl himself seems to be of two minds about the particularist Methodist, because once he develops okay. his, you know, phenomenological method, it sounds like the method starts doing a lot of gatekeeping for what is a permissible uh, phenomenon. Okay. I yeah. take that to not be great. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. So, but yeah, I'm glad you mentioned Chisholm in this connection because in the particularist Methodist debate, I think I side more with particularists. Yeah. Okay. Well, so I wanted to I wanted to ask which one like popular philosophy type question trying to do this more. Um, and, and I wanted to ask about, you know, um, about a computer simulation. If uh, I know it's so skeptical and so weird, but um, when it comes to like, well, I think we got to go back to concepts really quick. So uh, a concept is uh, it's it's not just in my head. Right. So like it's a shareable property yeah. of a mental act that bestows its intentionality on that act. And and it exists in the in a platonic realm? It's a property, so it has the being of properties. Whatever properties. Primal yeah. sand, multiply instantiable. Okay, That's gotcha. Um, if 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 we were if we were living in a computer simulation, yeah. if it were possible to uh, create sims uh, who, who think like us, could they could they also, um, would their concepts also refer to the same things with their concept of chair, even though they've been, you know, they've been only 
aware or directly acquainted with uh, digital chairs, uh, virtual chairs, would there still refer to uh, like the concept of chair? Do, you, like, does causal relation does does uh, does uh, interaction with with chairs do anything on the constitutive model? I think interaction with chairs does something on the constitutive okay. model, and causation okay. might be necessary for interaction. Okay, um, it's just not constitutive of what makes this intentional act relate to its object. But if okay. I'm not causally connected with chairs, then I'm going to have a pretty hard time perceiving them and ever establishing that relation to begin with, right? Well, so so if you're a sim and you have you know you've you've been uh, associated yeah. with with digital ones, and then maybe we like we bring you out into the real world, yeah, and you see a chair. Is it fine? You just roll. You able to roll with it, or did, would that it's mess with such a hard question? I don't know what to say. <laughs> I mean, I, I think some ink has been spilled. I mean, you said that this is a skeptical scenario, and then on some readings it is. I'm I'm kind of attracted to do the David Chalmers reading where okay. the computer simulation hypothesis is not a skeptical scenario. It's really a question of what uh, about it's a metaphysical question about what materially constitutes things like chairs. Sure. So if I'm in the sim world, the things I encounter. Um, are not nothings they're something they're chairs which are digitally constituted yeah. by computer code and then the chairs out here in the actual world are chairs which are materially constituted by well, i don't know fundamental particles or strings or whatever okay. the latest story on physics is right 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 so these are two different whether or not we count these as two different types of chairs are all falling under the extension of the concept chair i don't have firm thoughts on that but it yeah. seems like there is a way of 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 describing the simulation scenario where um, the con my concept of chair refers just fine to chairs which are materially constituted by computer code mm. and they exist and I encounter them as they are. Yeah. So as long, I, I guess this, this makes more sense as I, I heard you talking because our concept of chair uh, isn't so fine grained that it includes base reality, fundamental particles instead of digital it's just a, a chair it's just four legs or I, it's kind of hard to flesh out what a chair really is because i have yeah, no, wheels I over here but right yeah yeah i mean i think the case gets harder if you start talking about natural kind terms like water yeah where where i do go in for the arguments by putnam and others that water our term water refers to h2o it okay. doesn't refer to the liquidy stuff of our acquaintance so, so there if we're yeah. If we were in that case, it seems to me if we were in a simulation, then our concept of water would refer to a different stuff than the concept of than the concept of water out in the out in the main world. Interesting. It would still be an anti-skeptical point, though, that because it would still you could still go with the Chalmers interpretation on which what I'm encountering is water, which is materially constituted by bits of computer code, and that, that it exists, and I encounter it. But would it be a natural kind still? I don't know. I guess maybe you, you talk about pictures indirectly or something, right? We could maybe go in for that. We, we could maybe go in for that, but I don't think the simulation world is a world in which I'm aware of images or pictures. Yeah, Because I right. don't think that's a correct phenomenological description. of it. I'm not using the stuff in the glass as a representation of something else. Right. So, you know, part of it is to clarify the notion of simulation. It's not a simulation to me if I'm really taken in by this. My intentional acts terminate oh, yeah. in those objects. They don't then refer to some other further stuff, even if right. that, even if it's a simulation of that stuff. It's not a representation of it for me because I'm not using it as a representation. Um, that's good. And and that's something we didn't talk about, but you talk about the for me uh, type stuff in, in your treatment of intentionality. Well, book. yeah, I mean, getting this from largely from Dan Zahavi, and that okay. has to do with the structure of self-consciousness. But in this particular argument, the claim by Husserl is that for something to be a representation is to function as a representation for me. Do you have to be so aware of it, it as a reference? I think that's what you're kind of getting yeah, at. Yeah, you have to be aware of it as a representation. Okay. And so water it's, would it's, not be that. Yeah, water wouldn't be that. So it's not like when, I mean, right, so if a dog perceives the English word bone, it's perceiving something which is in fact a representation of bones, but it's not thereby indirectly aware of any bones because yeah. that that physical sign is not functioning as a representation. To, for, 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 for Fido or whatever. That's right. That's great. That's really, but but for me, I'm reading bone on yeah, the yeah. jar or whatever, and it is. is. Yeah. yeah, that's right. 
Yeah. Man, that's so cool. Okay. Well, Dr. Hop, this has been awesome, man. Thanks for letting me go on like random rabbit trails and um so well, thanks for letting me. Yeah, thanks for having me on. And, yeah, uh, this was really fun. Um I, I I hope I can coax you into coming back on because there's so much in this book that we didn't even cover. And I it's just so helpful for me in thinking about intentionality and philosophy of mind type stuff that I haven't been exposed to enough. And so this has been I feel like I leveled up in in getting through some of your work here. Well, hey, yeah, thanks for having me on. It was it was a pleasure talking to you. Yeah. Um, before I let you go, though, is there any place if someone wanted to find some more of your work, um, where where could they go to to hear more from you or read more? I from mean, you? I have an academia page. Okay. And I have some papers uploaded there. So awesome. Then fill right. papers with lists and stuff I have. But yeah, the Great. book is probably the place to start. I guess. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. And I'll put the links to to both those in the description wherever you're you're listening, folks at home. Um, that's gonna have to do it for now, folks. This has been Parker's Pensies. And as always, all glory to God.